Welcome to Mr. Giant Reacts a Ting and Ting and Ting. I'm Mr. Giant. How are all the giants doing out there today, huh? Hope you guys are doing great. Today we're going to be watching the video Truth About the Irish. First slaves brought to the Americas. And it's by Forgotten History. When we think of uh, slavery, we basically think of the African slave trade. Uh, and we don't pay very much attention to uh, the other people that suffered slavery during the times of the, of the uh, African slave trade and even before. But uh, I'm trying to learn more about this stuff because, you know, hey, I'm a logical dude. I, I know there were slaves before and they, they've been slaved, slaves after. But we get so caught up in our own history and uh, our own sense of victimhood that we don't pay attention to what's going on around us with other people. But if we start paying attention to what's going on around us with the other people, then we'll start understanding each other and maybe it wouldn't happen again in the same scale that it had before because we realize anybody could be a slave. Anybody. Let's YouTube and Sim Simmer and learn more about uh, the enslavement of the Irish. There has been an ongoing debate as to whether the Irish were the first slaves in the Americas, predating the first black African slaves by almost a decade. Slavery is perhaps one of the oldest profit-making endeavors in human history, and the Irish were a special target for a thousand years. Throughout history, the Irish were persecuted by one faction or another to include enslavement. You know, here's a question. I asked that question about uh, uh, Jewish people. Uh, and why they seem to be targeted. And you could say it's religious or whatever it is, but it seems like the Irish people had the same issue. They seem to have been targeted and uh, treated not so well or <laughs> adversely bad. And hopefully this would give me some idea of why that is, but hit me up in the comments section and, and, and here's, here's the thing, that, that the reason why, okay, and I'm going to say this here, and some people will say, oh, listen, they kind of look like everybody else, you know what I mean? If, you, if they don't speak it, you won't be able to tell the difference between an Irishman and a Scotsman and, uh, you know, or a German per se. There's certain differences, but you wouldn't be able to if you just look at the color of skin. So then what is it? Are they considered a different race or something? You know, somebody uh, had commented on one of the Irish videos and said that they said that there was racism against the Irish. If it was racism, what race were they considered to be? Hit me up in the, in the comment section. So, you know, do they look that different from the rest of Europeans out there? It's kind of like some people can't tell the difference really between an African or a Caribbean person or a black person from somewhere else. I could tell the difference by the way they walk because people's culture dictate their persona. Let's get back to this. And indentured servitude. When did the Irish first become slaves? How long did the selling of the Irish continue? Who was responsible? Hello, I'm Colin Heaton, former soldier, Marine Corps scout sniper, history professor, historian and book author. And we will answer these questions and other issues on this segment of Forgotten History. All right. Some groups deny the Irish slavery under English and later British rule, claiming that this was nothing more than voluntary indentured servitude, which did exist. However, there are counter arguments that will be challenged here. There is a legitimate dispute as to the numbers enslaved, especially during the 17th century before the Act of Union in 1707. The official British legal terminology used was indentured servants. Whether the servants in question had willingly signed the indentured contract to immigrate to the Americas or were first to go, many were forced. Therefore, those transported unwillingly and effectively sold were not considered to be indentured. This included political prisoners, vagrants, convicts, political activists, thieves, prostitutes, or people who had been defined as undesirable by the English government. 
I so so I I like the the different segments of it. No, I like it's not over, but I I understand the different segments of it there. You know what I mean? Uh, prisoners and all of that. And I think to a certain degree, that is the extent of the differences between the African slave trade and this slave trade. They justified it by getting prisoners and, and stuff like that. Now, the only one thing that would be sort of similar would be the undesirables. Because, you know, the Africans were considered uncivilized, which would make them undesirable. And uh, now the, the, the Irish, what, were they cons what, what section of them was considered the undesirables? Because wouldn't be criminals fall under that uh, category too? Irish introduction to slavery was during the first Viking raids in the year 795, lasting through the mid 9th century. This period saw the Irish killed and enslaved. Just like many other societies, the Vikings attacked. Most of these early raids were along the northern and eastern coast using hit and run tactics. The Vikings would then flee with treasure and slaves and return to either their holdings in Scotland or back to Norway. Usually, many slaves who were of value were ransomed back to their families but others remained in captivity. Then, from the year 837 onward, larger targets such as the greater monastic towns of Armagh, Glendalough, Kildare, Slane, Clonard, and Clonmacnoise, and Lismore were hit by larger forces. These large-scale raids generally spared the smaller local churches and villages far inland, but slaves were still taken, mostly to Scotland and Iceland. In 875, Irish slaves in Iceland launched Europe's largest slave rebellion since the end of the Roman Empire, when Hulfjörlif Holmarsson's slaves killed him and fled to Vesmanyar. In 841, the port that became known as Dublin was taken and occupied by both Olaf and Ivar the Boneless. And by 853, this part of Ireland was a Norse trading center and slaves were a large part of it. The slave trade did not stop with Ivar's death in 873. Finally, in 902, driven out of Dublin by the combined forces of Brega and Leinster, the, but the Vikings came back in 914 and reclaimed all the territory, taking more slaves. But Irish resistance was not over. In 980, the Irish, under Mail Sectional Mac Domnail, King of Meath, fought and managed to defeat the Vikings and freed all of their slaves. Some Vikings who remained assimilated and adapted to Christianity and became part of Irish society. The final nail in the coffin regarding Vikings holding land and taking slaves was in 1014 at the Battle of Clontarf, when Brian Baru, High King of Ireland, attacked Dublin, aided by his allies, the Limerick Vikings. They fought other Irish allied to the local Vikings in Dublin, and Baru's force won, and all the slaves were again freed, thus ending the legacy of constant Norse raids, whether from Danes or Norwegians. The period forced enslavement and severity ended, a century after the Norman invasion of England in October 1066. Subsequent Norman rulers of England eyed Ireland, and slavery in its true form was abolished in 1102. In 1155, Pope Adrian IV supposedly gave Henry II of England a papal bull, granting the king the authority to invade Ireland. However, many historians believe that this authorization was a forgery. Regardless, Henry II of England faced excommunication for the murder of Thomas a Becket, the Archbishop of Canterbury, so it is possible. However, Adrian's successor, Pope Alexander III, granted the lands of Ireland to Henry II, although it was not his land to give. The Norman conquest of England and Ireland were cataclysmic events that would shape Ireland's as well as world history and create tensions with England for the next 800 years. The Normans were initially invited to Ireland by Dermot McMurrah, the deposed King of Leinster. He is sometimes referred to as Dermot of the Foreigners, and his grandmother was the granddaughter of Brian Baru. In October 1171, King Henry II landed in Ireland and allowed Dermot to recruit soldiers and mercenaries, as Ireland was made up of several kingdoms at war with each other. The city of Dublin and the surrounding area were under Norman occupation and would be called the Pale, or the Safe Zone. Going beyond that was considered foolish, hence the term we use today, going beyond the Pale. But the Normans ended the practice of slavery in Ireland, but not serfdom, for at least a few hundred years. Despite the Norman abolishment of slavery, serfdom was still alive and well. Serfs were, unlike slaves, bound to the land. 
and the land meant everything. So selling people into slavery would have left no one to farm and conduct agriculture. Following the Battle of Kinsale in 1601, when the Irish and Spanish alliance was defeated, the Irish aristocracy fled to Europe, but the commoners remained, and they left the power vacuum filled by English nobles. Reports vary, and the numbers are in dispute, but the high number is that English forces had 30,000 captured Irish and Spanish soldiers. Other sources say half that number, around 15,000, were engaged, with 7,000 to 8,000 being captured. The Spanish allies were allowed to leave, but not the Irish. In 1603 or 1604, King James I of England, crowned on March 23, 1603, reportedly issued the order of banishment. This allowed those Irish captured to be sold, a permanent banishment. After nearly a decade, the king gave permission for the English governor general to collect and sell the captured Irish soldiers as slaves and send them to the New World in the Americas. In 1612, the first recorded Irish slaves were sold possibly to the Portuguese, and taken to the Amazon River Basin in their colony in modern-day Brazil. This brought them to the New World. There has been some dispute as to whether these people were indentured servants or slaves, but it is clear that they were forced out of Ireland to the New World, so it seems illogical and ridiculous to assume that they went voluntarily, hence the status of slaves. It has been... No, no. I I've always heard people talk about the Irish heritage of the island, and I've always heard, like, you know, Irish, uh, stories of Irishmen and stuff all through the islands and all of that, you know? And, uh, I never really thought that they had come there as indentured servants or slaves. I never really did. And it, <laughs> I think it's because they were so different than us as far as the way they look people would assume that they wouldn't be slaves because they look like the people who enslaved them and then we don't talk to each other as much as we should so we don't know the extent of suffering and stuff that both sides have had and that's the cool thing about the internet and places like YouTube, we could learn those things and then we could say in retrospect, really, we were really a lot more alike than we thought we were. That's in those, the, the people who were, you know, enslaved and stuff, but we like, we're not that much different in our historical... Why am I struggling for words so much still? But our, our, our historical existence, we're not that different. So then why don't we just chill out and find common ground right now? You know what I mean? And this is what history should serve to do. Find the common ground in our history and start using that to understand each other now. Because uh, slavery has definitely segregated people. You know what I mean? Some people take sides and you know, people still argue about it. But if we have a common sort of history, though it's from a different cultural perspective, people are people. No matter what culture, whatever historical sufferings they have and we have, if similar, could probably draw some kind of a bond between us. You know what I'm saying? That would be kind of cool. Let's get back to this here. It's been chronicled that in 1625, James I's son, Charles I, issued the decree, and it may be possible before his death in March 1625, but given the timeline and James's death, it would appear that his son, Charles, probably did issue the royal decree authorizing the Irish slaves. This included prisoners captured, those deemed to be common criminals, and rabble-rousers who were sold. They were to become the property of the English plantation owners in the North American colonies. As a result, tens of thousands of Irish men and women were sent to the Eastern American colonies, as well as Guyana, Antigua, and Montserrat. As well, between 1629 and 1632, as other Caribbean locations over the next few decades were infiltrated, but the exact number may never be known. By 1637, approximately 69% of the population of Montserrat were Irish. Many were indentured servants, yet some were slaves. The rationale was simple. Black slaves had to be purchased at a cost of around 20 to 50 pounds sterling, a huge sum of money in those days. 
However, Irish slaves were sold for 900 pounds of cotton per person, but also traded for tobacco and indigo in a straight barter system. It would appear that the Irish then became the largest source of slaves for English slave traders and plantation owners at that time, far surpassing the African slave trade until the early to mid 1700s. Wow. Between 1641 during the Irish Rebellion to 1652, it has been stated that over 550,000 Irish were killed by English forces and 300,000 more were sold as slaves, mostly military aged men. Their children, especially women and girls, were sold and considered quite valuable in the domestic service role. The greatest perpetrator of this was Oliver Cromwell, who defeated Charles I in 1649 during the English Civil War and had him executed. Cromwell, as Lord Protector, waged a ruthless war against the Irish, starting in 1649. By 1650, it is claimed that nearly 29,000 Irish were sold to planters in St. Kitt. During the decade of the 1650s, it is also claimed, as well as disputed, that around 100,000 Irish children, generally from 10 to 14 years of age, were taken from their parents and were also sold, and sold themselves also as slaves or indentured servants in the West Indies, Virginia, the Carolinas, and New England. It is also claimed that between 1651 and 1660, the Irish slaves far outnumbered the colonists in all areas. In 1652, Cromwell ordered that 12,000 Irish were to be sold to Barbados. And those numbers are not in dispute, only their status. On 1 May 1654, his To Hell or To Connacht proclamation was issued during the Act of Settlement of 1662. This was when the English began confiscating all Irish-held lands, and the native Irish were relocated west of the Shannon River. Those who resisted were sent to the West Indies as slaves wow. or executed. His own words proclaimed, quote, those who failed to transplant themselves into Connacht or County Clare within six months shall be attained of high treason, or to be sent to America or other parts beyond the seas. Those banished who return ought to suffer the pains of death as felons by virtue of this act without benefit of clergy. End quote. The English could kill the Irish without penalty, but selling them offered great profit. It is claimed that over 80,000 more Irish were sold, with 52,000 going to the colonies of Barbados and Virginia, but again we cannot verify the exact numbers. Many argue that these were indentured servants, not slaves, yet there are no records of contracts between those forcibly removed and their benefactors. One may assume that, given the barter system of using tobacco and cotton as a trade item for workers, that these deported Irish were, in fact, slaves. You know, I, 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 I'm watching this and I'm like, okay, so why the Irish, you know? What in the history has back then deemed them to be less than to be treated like that? Now, on top of that, there's there shouldn't be any hate between anybody now. They should be uh, getting to know each other now because the majority of us are uh, just alike. Walking stiffs, man, trying to make ends meet all over this world. Now, the, the derivative of what derived from the slave trade is the racism. And I, I note, I said derived. That doesn't say racism was, uh, slavery was caused by racism because it's quite obvious that it wasn't. But uh, they're looking down on people. But then again, that had to be something before these people were enslaved to justify the enslavement. And not just as, uh, as, as undesirables or anything like that, but just as a people as a whole, you know, a, a race, a different race, or a different culture, or whatever. What is it in those cultures that create this amnesty to start the slave trade? Maybe that will never be answered, but that, that's a really good question to be asked. Because I can't look down on somebody so much to have them to treat them like that. And most people aren't. Black, white, Indian, uh, from East Indian. Most people aren't like that. So what is it that created this massive... Uh, exodus, forceful exodus of people to be slaves 
of any race or culture or you know I know it's greed to begin with but people are greedy upon their own people too their own race so what is it about certain groups that make it so that everybody else would look the other way sort of and not pay attention to it no all of this has happened all those years ago. Holding, I don't hold any amnesty for people saying that, oh, well, your ancestors enslaved my ancestors. No, 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 no. I look at it from the modern times. Hey, wait a minute. You're a working stiff just like me. You're struggling to make ends just like me. We have more in common, as far as that is concerned, surviving, than we do one person is better than the other. And we got to start looking at it from that perspective instead of looking at the past and thinking we deserve this or we deserve that or you know unless the bigotry and the racism and the uh, disliking of different cultures come into play we need to respect each other for who we are you know what I mean which is human beings first and foremost Let's get back to this here. 1656, the Council of State ordered the roundup of 1,000 Irish girls and 1,000 Irish boys in their early teens, even some children, to be rounded up and sold to Jamaican planters. These numbers are in dispute, but do seem reasonable, as these would be children whose parents were already deported. Part of this order was an edict passed on October 2nd, 1665, which stated, quote, Upon report of Committee for America concerning proposals for transporting persons from Long Island to Jamaica to confer with the Committee for Jamaica, end quote. The persons were Irish, and no indentured servant would be released to go to Jamaica. These had to be forcibly exported Irish, who were already present in New York. In fact, some of the English receiving these Irish slaves seemed rather concerned, hence this following report, quote, Commission appointing Cornelius Holland, Colonel Owen Rowe, Sir Thomas Roth, and 14 others a company by the name of the governor and a company of the city of London for the plantation of the Somers Islands to take into consideration the present condition of those plantations, many well-affected persons there having been much oppressed and unjustly dealt with in relation to matters of conscience." End quote. Whitehall, 1653, June 28th. This situation with the forcibly removed Irish, not being a people to take subjugation lightly, appeared to have created the fear of an uprising. And this seems to be explained in the Whitehall document from November 18th, 1656. Quote, the Council of State to Captain Wilkinson, importance of the Summers Islands to the interest of the Commonwealth. Supposition that the Spaniards will endeavor to get a footing there. Doubtful that a principle of disaffection may yet be retained by some of the inhabitants. He is encouraged to attend to his duties as commander of the fort, to keep a vigilant eye upon the malignant and discontented party, that they may have the less opportunity to prejudice the island's safety, and to use his best endeavors to secure the interest of the commonwealth." End quote. This referred to the Irish population that must have been slaves and they feared an uprising. No reason to worry about indentured servants. So, whether one accepts the reality of Irish slavery or not, the fact remains that there were Irish people forced into slavery. However, the exact numbers may never be known. We hope you enjoyed this segment of Forgotten History. Please click like and subscribe. Okay, that was very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, like I said, I've heard a little bit about it, but this is the first time I've actually delved into it. I'm going to, you know, uh, educate myself some more about it and take you know what I mean because uh, we shouldn't forget it but we shouldn't use it to browbeat people today anyway man I hope you guys uh, found this as interesting as I did uh, I am going to leave a link in the description to this video so you could go check it out the thing and uh, I'll also leave uh, links in this video one up top and a card there so you could go watch other videos about Ireland that I have uh, reacted to and take. And if you enjoyed this, hit a like in there, you know, to help and 
yeah, you know, so other people could see it and thing, you know what I mean? And we could all learn together about these, these uh, historical events. Thank you all again for watching it with me. And for those of you who suggested videos, because this one was one that was suggested, thank you. Y'all take care of each other, all right? Cool runnings.